Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Cloud Wars Live, the digital revolutions in full swing. And we're going to take a look today at some of the happenings in the industrial markets. We've got one of our favorite monthly guests back with us, Tony Uphoff, who is CEO of Thomas. And Thomas takes a great deep look into what's going on with buyers and sellers, manufacturing industrial markets. Tony, welcome back to Cloud Wars Live. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey, Bob, it's always great to be on. And by the way, do you say that about all of your guests, that one of your favorite guests oh, is that? Please, please, Tony, I'm a little bit hurt that you would ask. All um, right, good. Well, I need reassurance once in a while, as you know. Let me stop. The favorite guest appearing in <laughs> right here, Tony Alpha. Bill, you can't edit that out. Come on, fella, you got to leave that one in. <laughs> good deal, Tony, fair enough. We'll make sure that stays in for sure. Um, Tony, you know, there's there's lots of things going on. Uh, I, I thought that uh, some of the points that you were making about, uh, you know, one of the great things that Thomas is doing is helping to put together some quarterly numbers here and some data that shows some pretty wild trends. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, starting about a little over a year ago now, Bob, we started to supplement our real-time data of sourcing and demand across both products and uh, services in the industrial marketplace. Um, with a deeper dive into the quarterly trends and comparing, you know, uh, one quarter to another, like quarter to like quarter, but also trying to make some predictions based on what we're seeing. And so, started this last year. Last uh, year, we do a webinar with the results, and then we provide a free downloadable copy of the report. So, all your listeners, if they're interested, afterwards can go to thomasnet.com and download the report. I thought it might be fun to talk about some of the trends, Bob, because it very directly relates a lot to technology-oriented markets. And if you kind of look at industrial markets and manufacturing markets as simply huge adopters of technology, I think for a lot of your listeners, you're seeing the major cloud vendors are all in their top two or three focus of vertical cloud is manufacturing. Manufacturing is also, uh, Bob, going through for lack of a better term, let me call it a redefinition phase where I think people are taking an enlightened view of what manufacturing is, particularly in this country today, that it is in and of itself a high-tech industry. And so the, the old kind of dated view of what manufacturing is to what it, it, it actually is today, I think is going through a little bit of a, um, a, 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 a reimagining, if you will, all the long way of saying, I think for a lot of your listeners, understanding the trends in this, you know, $2.8 trillion marketplace, AKA US manufacturing, given the implications with uh, the adoption of technology, it's good that your listeners understand some of these trends. Sure, Tony, look forward to that. And, you know, as you said, uh, earlier this year, I think Microsoft introduced its manufacturing cloud, Salesforce is right now at the manufacturing cloud. Uh, certainly SAP has a long history of that. Oracle as well. So it is definitely something where those companies, which could sort of pick which industry clouds to prioritize, they've all seen what's going on with manufacturing and have certainly jumped in there. So it sounds like fun. And Tony, what, what does some of your, uh, your QT findings tell you about what has happened? And I'm always happy to put you on the spot, Tony, because I love you. What does that say about the future as well? Yes, what could we predict? Well, um, if, if you look at, we look at both products and services and, you know, we have, as, as Bob, I've shared with you and, and your listeners before, we have 70,000 categories on thomasnet.com. So every second, somebody's sourcing a product or service in, in one or more of those categories. I, I'll just kind of go through top 20 looks at this because it's an exhaustive uh, list, but there's some really interesting things happening if you look at the top 20. So across the top 20, you have um, traditional materials, things like steel at number three, um, you know, uh, lumber at number 10, pumps, you know, industrial pumps at number 11, which would indicate a broad sense that we're seeing the jets turning back on in manufacturing and, and a healthy industrial economy kind of restarting, if you will, or, or getting back to work. But then you see really fascinating things like a, a huge amount of demand for printed circuit boards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, printed circuit boards, when you think manufacturing printed circuit boards, well, that must be consumer electronics. What's fascinating today, Bob, is the, the increase in demand for PCB boards 
is not solely coming from the traditional consumer electronics. It, it's really coming from the auto industry. It's also coming, believe it or not, from the housing industry and other parts of manufacturing. In essence, everything we use, buy, or, or, or have access to do, uh, today has a computer in it, let's face it. And, and so, you know, broadly speaking, I think you're seeing some fascinating dynamics where computers are being fundamentally designed into, you know, virtually anything and everything. But I think probably closer to home for many of your listeners is um, one of the top categories as it is every quarter is automation equipment. Now we track a ton of different subsets within automation equipment. So it could, it, it ranges literally in the hundreds of different subcategories, everything from robotics to, you know, artificial intelligence to all kinds of different tools and applications. But it, as I mentioned in the wind up, Bob, this is, you know, a market transition where you're seeing an industry as large as industrial manufacturing go through a protracted digital transformation is really rare. The only thing I would compare it to, Bob, that you and I have been witnessing is broadly speaking, business technology, where, you know, a lot of knowledge work over the last, what, decade plus has gone through this protracted and, and ongoing digital transformation. But you are seeing a remarkable level of technology adoption. And I would emphasize to your audience, this is moving beyond just things that these organizations are looking for on the factory floor. So, you know, some obvious things like robotics or artificial intelligence or something a little more vertical in nature, a CNC machining, which is, is a computer driven machine that manufactures prototypes and, and parts on spec. That kind of technology adoption has been happening for a while, which really starting to happen is things like data and artificial intelligence and sensor-based technology and things that are supplementing traditional product manufacturing with the ability to add either a new business model or a new level of data and insight up to and including things like additive manufacturing, Bob, which is just on an unbelievable growth of adoption. And as your listeners would know, you know, this is also known as 3D manufacturing, 3D printing, pardon me. And what this allows you to do is literally print a part, if you will. Or, and, and so two things are happening in the industry. One is, boy, I can take this remarkable technology and adopt it at a relatively low cost. And I can locate it in a customer's office uh, or facility and or near a customer. So now suddenly I can start to think of, oh, I can bypass a lot of shipping and logistics and complexity and distributors. And I can start to go DTC here and go direct to my customer in ways that I've, I probably just you know, dreamed, of, dreamed of before. And the level of adoption we're seeing, particularly with additive manufacturing, Bob, is just literally off the charts. So we saw it in Q1. We're seeing it in Q2. First bold prediction for your audience here, guess what? <laughs> in Q3 of this year, you're gonna see a dramatic lift in demand and, and adoption of uh, additive manufacturing. Not a tough prediction to make, but something I would encourage your listeners to really follow the money here because there's a, a remarkable adoption of these advanced technologies and where those types of technologies go other technologies follow, the need for cloud services, the need for ERP systems, the need for other types of technology that, that go along with this level of adoption. Yeah, and Tony, I was thinking about that too. Um, it's, I, I never quite understood this very broad sort of halo term, but product lifecycle management. I, mean, I, I know what it is. I think the term is kind of awkward, but if you get, uh, big boom in additive manufacturing capability, right? Then uh, how can you have a, a customer or buyer connected in over some, you know, video conference call with the designer and they're working on things together. And, uh, you know, it's just a whole new way of designing things, right? Where the customer is not left out to just look at the finished product, but is intimately involved more and more with the design, the specking, customization, variations on that. It, it's, it is a wild thing to contemplate. Yeah, and Bob, we've talked about this before. This idea of digital transformation gets overused and, and, and I could certainly be somebody that, uh, that overuses the terminology there, but 
if you if you unpack it a bit and really look at what's happening, what you're witnessing in the industrial and manufacturing marketplace is the convergence of really kind of three elements of a supply chain. Certainly the convergence of a digital supply chain. In other words, being able to follow my supply chain and understand the trends and in real time react or act on it and then over time improve it. But it's now converging with both the financial supply chain, but also the physical supply chain. So kind of to your point, I can now start to look at those three in concert and determine, hey, wait, wait a minute, from a cost point of view, it doesn't make sense for me to manufacture the part here and ship it over there when I factor in the time and the delays and all that kind of stuff. What's the cost of that additive manufacturing again? And can't I connect the customer into that system? And can I shorten the time to value? You know, we tend to get caught up as producers of products and services in the time to market or the time to revenue, the, the real what thing you want to do in today's world is what's the time to value for my customer? Can I shorten that time to value? And I think we don't historically think of manufacturing as a short time to value time horizon, right? You know, hey, Bob, build me a rocket. Uh, great, Tony. Okay, call me in 18 months and I'll show you the prototype. But I think that's what's starting to happen is the impact of these technologies is now opening up whole new worlds for these types of companies. The other thing that's, that's starting to happen, and I, I'll make another prediction, and this is somewhat adjacent to the, the sourcing by product or service, Bob. I think you're gonna see a slow but steady rise in where manufacturing happens and particularly manufacturing in cities. So if you go back in history, manufacturing was in cities. You know, there, there wasn't always great zoning. So you'd have these you know, manufacturing facility next to a bakery, next to a, a school, for God's sake, right? That changed as manufacturing had, you know, waste outputs and other things that by and large didn't work well inside the confines of a city. Today, Bob, through the magic of the type of technology we're describing, there's 8,000 manufacturers. Yes, I said 8,000 manufacturers in the five boroughs of New York City, and they're producing $7.75 billion of output per year. Now, you know, if, if, if you were asked on Jeopardy, how many manufacturers are in the state, or not the state, but the city of New York, you wouldn't, I nor would have I ever guessed 8,000. Most of these are small. Most of these are medium size, if you will, but, but kind of to the point we're having, Bob, they're also able to now access technology that doesn't produce waste, that doesn't produce um, you know, a, a broader carbon footprint that enables them to produce this in relatively small uh, facilities as well. Specialized, uh, faster, quicker, and Tony, right? All these things we've, we've talked about some before, but this idea that, you know, the traditional business thinking get to be a medium sized, a big company, you want to build moats around, you know, your marketplace so that uh, nobody else can get in. Well, it, it's just absurd now. And you see, I, I wonder what percentage of these are relatively young companies that are moving in and doing things that just weren't possible before. So, that, that, that's exciting. And certainly somebody who lives in Pittsburgh, um, yeah, that history of, you know, being a manufacturing hub and what went on there, but they, you know, required these huge, massive facilities and it, it doesn't have that, that scale has changed. And it's more the technology driven precision, right? You know, Bob, for, I think the average business person who may not, you know, be as familiar with some of these vertical marketplaces or really understand manufacturing, I'd, I'd compare it to computing, you know, those, those famous photographs where they show, you know, some of the early computers that took up the equivalent of two or three rooms. And, you know, they, they, in comparative, they didn't have the computing power I've got that I can carry in my pocket today. I think you and I are describing a similar paradigm here. Not that it's all that much smaller, but if, if I can actually produce products and services in a smaller physical footprint, the, the world opens up in a way that I can locate what I think of as a factory. I can create jobs. I can do all kinds of things in small footprint locations. And I, I can also start to think, gee, I don't have to necessarily have them in an area that are, is, is remote from residential housing or other areas because I don't have the pollutants and other things that a bygone era of manufacturing at a certain level did. Certainly, 
you know that well from from the Pittsburgh area. But if you look at what's happened in Pittsburgh, where there's been a complete, you know, turnaround, and it's one of the hotbeds of advanced manufacturing uh, today. As, as a matter of fact, in our we break down the the uh, the demand by, by region, and um, it, it it is remarkable to see what's happening in the state. Uh, at the state level there, that is still a remarkable hotbed of manufacturing. And to your point, it would be interesting to know, um, are we starting to see the emergence of new young companies as well as the reinvention of some legacy companies? And, and my guess is, I don't have data on that, Bob, but my guess is both are true. Mm, wow. Uh, no, very exciting time, Tony. Again, I think it's one of the reasons why I think there's so much uh, optimism and opportunity right now for new things, right? Where you get that uh, fusion of technology and manufacturing, fusion of technology and industry, being able to do things today that just five or 10 years ago were just simply unfathomable or unpractical. So uh, very exciting. Tony, I wanted to mention, uh, a, you know, a, a comparison you made a few minutes ago about, you know, we haven't seen something of this scale, perhaps you said since really the business technology boom, I was concerned that you know, I'm much older than you are. I get that. But I thought you're going to take it back to the Industrial Revolution and ask me what that was like. Bob, I understand it was a very exciting time. There, there was there was roughly about 75 million people in the United States. I think uh, the horse was just yeah yeah the horse was just transitioning as the dominant form of transportation to uh, this wild crazy idea of the automobile. There was a lot going on, and uh, I understand those were heady heady days. You, you know what is really remarkably you know not only poignant and funny about your comment is. You know, you and I have, have had such the great experience of being able to witness the dawning of transitions before. And, you know, we we were early in understanding how the PC was going to revolutionize the way, you know, industry and business worked. And we saw, you know, business technology and cloud computing and these other kind of new technologies, mobile, transform really culture and and, and business. Um, I, I think it's really remarkable that we're witnessing those yet again. And I think it's easy to take them for granted, Bob. I really do. And not that I'm trying to overhype it and say, oh, this is bigger than the industrial revolution. But I think we are witnessing, you know, beyond just manufacturing in the industrial markets, but I think we're witnessing a whole new era of how um, products are conceived, how they're designed, how they're built, how they're manufactured, how they're distributed. And, and I think, you know, if that's not really the promise of technology, but I wonder if somebody, you know, I don't know what's going to be a podcast in a hundred years from now, they'll look back at this, whatever version, they'll probably just, you know, they'll, they'll just intuit into your head through technology. You won't even have to listen, but um, they'll look back at this and realize we're, we're watching the beginning of, you know, they call it industry 4.0. There's been a lot of buzzwords thrown at this, but it, it's very clear, Bob, we're witnessing something going on here that that is, um, I, I want to stop just short of calling it game changing, but it is a significant market transition. And I think it holds a lot of promise, particularly for US companies um, that I think, you know, if, if I could say, have lagged behind some other countries um, in really understanding the implications of adopting some of these more advanced manufacturing technologies. But boy, is the U.S. catching up. I mean, yeah. it, it's moving very quickly. Well, Tony, you know, I think what's particularly profound about, you know, what you're describing here, we've got a couple of wildly different things that I think, you know, two, three years ago, uh, anybody who said they would have predicted this, I think, is, is crazy. As you've described, like with New York City, you've got manufacturing capabilities moving into urban areas. Yeah. At the same time, you've also got traditional people who were able to live and work in a city in an office job, a white collar type of environment, they want to move out now and, and work remotely. So cities are being redefined, you know, the, these capabilities and what's going on here. It's a, it's an extraordinary time. And it's one of the reasons I think that there's, there's good grounds for so much optimism and opportunity around these new technology driven uh, business models and reimaginations. It's uh, it's pretty crazy. 
And Tony, if I could, I want to take a moment here uh, to offer a word from our sponsor, BMC. BMC wants to know, is your business on its A game? That's when systems are intelligent by learning from markets where automation is paramount yet effortless and when technology and people work as one in an enterprise. The A game is your business at its absolute best. BMC calls this the autonomous digital enterprise. Find out more at bmc.com slash A game. So Professor Uphoff, uh, there's a couple of other industries you had some thoughts on that also might be in some ways sort of next in line with what's happened in industrial and manufacturing markets. Yeah, I think, you know, if, if, I, if I was to put myself in the, in the seat, gosh, talk about hubris here. If I was to put myself in the seat of one of these masters of the universe, Bob, you, one of your listeners that's running one of these massive cloud companies and looking at, you know, the, the markets and, and where they could continue the growth and probably also dealing with the pressure of running a publicly traded company that's got to have a rampant growth curve and all those types of things. There's only so many industries, right, that you can turn to. And so you start to go down the list. And again, you know, manufacturing is a fantastic example of a massive market opportunity for these types of vendors. You know, it's a nearly $3 trillion industry. Just in the last 12 months alone on thomasnet.com, we've processed over $204 billion worth of uh, requests for quotations just on our platform alone. So very vibrant, large scale market and represents great opportunity. But then you start to tick through, well, what are the next ones that have a similar size and scope? And, and you don't have to look very far before you get to healthcare. And you don't have to look far before you get to, let's call it broadly speaking education, if not just simply isolating higher education. And I'm kind of fascinated, Bob, as I think you are too, of you know, both of those industries, we could argue, are, are regulated or have some level of regulatory dynamics. But by the way, so has manufacturing. Yes. And so has other industries and businesses. And I, I'm kind of fascinated. It seems like every couple of years, we kind of say, OK, here it goes. You know, Apple's going to dive in and take over the healthcare industry. And then at the end of the year, we look around, oh, it, didn't, it didn't exactly happen, did it? You know, and the latest is, well, Amazon and Walmart are going to take over the healthcare industry and they're, they're going to do some unique things. And while I think there's some very, very clever and wildly innovative things going on there, I'm fascinated, Bob, as to why we aren't seeing more traction um, in really the transformation, the digital transformation of those industries. And, and you probably have better insights there than I do of what is starting to happen. Um, but I, I wonder if we won't look back and realize the forcing function of the pandemic. And unfortunately, it looks like it's not done with this yet. The forcing function of the pandemic may be the, you know, I hate to sound buzzy about it, but the tipping point or create some sort of dynamic there. But, but I look at those markets, Bob, and boy, you just, and, and I'm probably blissfully naive as to what the regulatory problems and the HIPAA laws and all the things that, that go along there, I'm probably closer to understand the education markets than I do the healthcare markets. And I'm well aware of uh, the challenge in, and primarily cultural one of, of the way, you know, uh, primarily the, the, the faculty model works in higher education. And as fantastic as it is, there's a certain natural scarcity that if I turn away 98% of the students I'm managing a luxury brand today in an elite university. My goal isn't to educate more people. My, my goal is to manage a luxury brand. It, that's, that's different than I think a lot of tech models are. Tech models are about scale and, and understanding how to access broader and broader markets. But I continue to look at those markets, Bob, and try to, try to figure out, is it, is it a matter of when? Or is it still if, you know, is there, are there still questions about whether those markets can be transformed in the way that many of us believe they should be? Yeah, yeah, Tony, you know, uh, with, with healthcare, I think it was just uh, maybe a month or so ago, but uh, Salesforce had a new product introduction. I don't follow a lot of new product introductions, but this one just stuck out for healthcare. It was something along the lines of appointment optimization application for healthcare. So 
if uh, it allows the patient or the consumer to express a certain number of uh, preferences, right? So that goes into it. Then, uh, you know, into the booking system is intelligent and can uh, read openings and what's possible. And given the type of uh, appointment that's needed, will there be a follow-up? How do you try to tie those things? In yeah. the you know, it, it is not, uh, you know, it's not a new form of brain surgery or something, but you start to think about that coming from the outside in of the, in some of the, the patient experience, the customer experience, what's going on there, and just that degree of specificity that exists here. So I, I think that, uh, again, with the, the rise of these industry-specific clouds, I think we're going to see a lot more of those sort of capabilities. And plenty, one thing about the higher ed stuff, I, I did an event with some people from uh, SAP recently and a big customer university in California. And I said, well, you know, isn't part of the problem that, you know, the higher education, it's, it's very slow moving. And they both, you know, bristled, no, 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 no. They said that that is not true. Uh, they're slow to make decisions, but once they make a decision, then mm -hmm. they move very quickly into what's happening there. So maybe on the back end of that, is there something that helps them make decisions more quickly and then allows more speed with that or is it just uh you know they are they, they're going to live in their own world like you said measuring you know offering some luxury brands here or there but it's it does seem like uh for as much progress as has been made in each of those areas there's a lot more to go and if i could suggest you something tony i don't know how much technology is involved in this but uh with the insights you have at thomas and so forth and your your own, you know, wisdom and perspective on things. Is there a way to bypass or substitute the little blue paper gown when you go into an examining room? Can you help? You know, Bob. Bob, we're we're working on that, and uh, it, we we've I've got a couple of designs there. Now there is a Thomas logo on it. I don't <laughs> know if that would be objectionable to you uh, or not. I have I've spotted you on occasion with the Cloud Wars Live Minute uh, wearing a ThomasNet.com uh, hat, which, I, listen, all the most fashionable people do these days. But uh, yeah, I, you know, it is it is really fascinating, though, Bob. To your point of go back to your point on customer experience. Goofing on the the little blue gown is a part of a crappy customer experience. I mean, it really is, and you look at. You know, how rarely if you, you know, I went in for a physical not too long ago, and I think you and I might have talked about this before. It, it was, you know, in this era of the, the COVID restrictions and different things. And so there, there was a fair amount of check-in that was telemedicine. And then I went in for the, the actual physical. And, and the combination of the telemedicine and the physical, by the time I actually got to the physical, I knew this this doctor, and I had never met him before, and I had a rapport with him, and and we we kind of picked up on a conversation, and I found it to be a better customer experience than walking in cold. Three different people ask you the same question. You fill out a form with the exact same questions, and then the doctor walks in and asks you the exact same questions, and you're thinking, okay, is this a test of my memory, or is this actually the way they think a customer experience ought to work? psychological stress test and in between being asked those same questions a bunch of times in the doctor walking in you are told take all your clothes off put this piece of blue paper on opening at the back um i yeah that to me it's like okay you know and then the doctor comes in and says well, you look a little apprehensive you know is there a no <laughs> no but I'm relaxed as can be. Yeah, <laughs> the floor is about forty-eight degrees, and uh, I've got my. I, yeah, it's. I, it's just, uh, but I think you know sometimes uh, talking with some people earlier today, right, about the, this thing of the you know this ongoing belief, Tony, that's been around for thirty or forty years. It's just like, hey, just buy more technology, everything will be fixed. But it's such a uh, second or third wave thing behind leadership, culture, and that sense of you know what are we doing I, this for. And, and it's interesting, Bob, to your culture point, one of the things that I, I, having taken a deeper look at this to the extent that I can and trying to understand the trends, and we see many things in our sourcing data on thomasnet.com that come out of medical that, that you know, most universities operate like small cities. So they source materials, they build buildings. So we see some of the trends there as well. But there is a common DNA thread, I think, culturally, 
which is both, um, both industries, if you will, if I can use that expression, are based on the, a, a deep respect for the wisdom and judgment of a small group of people who have achieved a level of um, academic, if not experiential, uh, wisdom. And having, you know, you look at our judicial process could be similar to this. I think anytime you see that, you run the risk that the culture says, whoa, 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 whoa. Artificial intelligence isn't going to help me make this decision. I'm going to decide who gets into the university. I'm going to decide who, who gets uh, an MBA. I'm going to decide what grade they get because I've worked my tail off and I've achieved a PhD and I've achieved tenure. And that comes, that right comes with this. As a doctor, I will, as a radiologist, look at these, these x-rays and determine whether the patient has a, a, a potential problem or not. And I'm probably overstating this, but I think in those environments, the, the idea that you would augment intelligence through the use of technology and make better, and better informed decisions and scale the impact of your wisdom. I think that's less intuitive, Bob, in those industries. And again, I'm, I'm, if there's physicians and educators listening to this, please don't, you know, don't tweet at me, I, you know, don't, don't throw stones here. Uh, but I, I do think that what oftentimes holds back transformations is we tend to get caught up and blame, you know, oh, there's regulatory issues or this, that, and the other. I think you know history teaches us that it's most of the time culture that really is holding it back. Could be could be governmental regulations, and that could be part of the issue. But I, I, I'm not so sure that I buy that. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you. So, but um, there are you know so many things that go along with that, and I think in some ways you get uh, you know I feel like a circus animal sometimes, right? You get trained to do things, accept things like, oh, yeah. you know, I'm an elephant and I weigh, you know, 6,000 pounds and I got this 150 pound person next to me, well, I, you know, but, oh, well, I'm just going to follow my training. You know, I, I yeah. can't, do it. I'll, do, I'll do what I do. And, uh, and they're, you know, wonderful people in there mean a lot, but yeah, it's a web of medical issues, privacy issues, regulatory issues, the whole COVID impact and everything. But uh, I, I think they're making great strides. And if, if they could do in what, you know, the old language of the front office, right, of the patient reception, check-in, those sorts of things, if they could do a tenth of what they do in the actual medical yeah. you know, procedures and the medical technology, I think that'd be, that would be a great thing. And Tony, before we, we close here, I know you, uh, I wanted to ask you about business travel. Because uh, we're talking about culture and changes and all that, um, I have uh, I've had a, a few business flights recently. I've got a few more coming up. I think it's all been fine. I I don't think I enjoy wearing a mask for you know multiple hours here, but those are the rules. And I, it seems that a lot of people are willing to do it. it it's not uh, so far that I've seen an impediment. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, you know I think it'll be fascinating to see this play out. And I don't mean fascinating as a proxy for, you know, look out, Will Smith, danger, danger. I don't mean it that way. I, I think um, there's, there's a couple of theories. A couple of theories is, hey, slow but steady. And we get back to a point where we look back on this and realize business travel is a part of daily life. And it goes back to, you know, some level close to what it was before. There's another theory that says um, we, we've, we've, uh, you know, no different than streaming of, of television programs and other things. We've, we've seen a, a hybrid future and there's gonna be some sort of shift and change and balance to that. The pro and con of either one is, is fairly apparent. I'm, I'm in the, the school where I'm increasingly thinking regardless of whether business travel comes back on a dollar level close to what it was. I think what could emerge here, Bob, is, a, is a, a focus on business travel, not unlike the way we think of going into an office. Mm -hmm. um, make it more special. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that the flight is more special, the hotel you stay in, um, that you know, most of your business travel is around going to an event. Mm -hmm. By definition, an event is, is unique. It has, it has a, a, a centricity and a value to it. You know, think, you know, I, I watch a, a, a lot of music on streaming or I listen to a lot of music, but boy, four or five times a year, I go to see a concert. 
And that's really special. That's, that's you know, something very, very unique. And I'm not suggesting therefore business travel, you know, diminishes, but similar to the way you and I, and I'm, I'm, I was always moved by McDermott's talk about what an office is as a, as a productivity tool. Will we see business travel where, you know, if it, it, you know, there's years I had, and certainly you had, where I, you know, I'd fly co close to 200,000 air miles a year, and if I look back on those, and I think to myself, of the meetings that I was flying to go to, how many of those did I really add value to, and, and how many were really important versus there was some sort of artificial expectation that that came with the job that you needed to do, and so. You know, as you can tell, this is a, a bit of a half-baked theory on my part at this stage, but I'm putting that that out there just because I'm curious as to where this will go. Will will we consider business travel something that is more special, as opposed to it's just the you know you, you you're constantly doing it. That's all you do. You're endlessly getting on an airplane to go visit customers, which I get that, and I do that as well, and I think it's critically important. But I I, I was. I was really motivated by your description of Bill McDermott's you know, discussion of the use of an office. I'm seeing how Thomas and other companies like ours are starting to, to redefine how an office fits into your workflow. Will business travel go through a similar, I don't wanna call it shift, Bob, because that sounds probably too dramatic, but you know, will it go through a similar um, you know, uh, uh, redefinition of some sort and, and therefore get placed as something that is more valuable, right? A, 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 you know, funny, just, you know, then I'll get off the topic here. Um, many, many years ago, I, I worked at a, at a company called Ziff Davis that not unlike CMP that you and I grew up at was a, was a real innovative uh, uh, media company, particularly focused on the technology markets. And th there was a company way back when, and, and I, I, I don't even know if this company is still around called Gateway Computer. And, and their tagline was outstanding in our field. And it, they literally meant it literally and figuratively. So they had this remarkable facility in South Dakota that was in the middle of a cornfield. And these two brothers had literally put up a, a lean-to and built this, this ultimately very successful company. It was a badge of honor to them if you made the trek to go visit them. It was a big deal to them. Yeah. And, and I can remember, true story, that, and I'd been warned about this, I'd come in with a sales rep and we were gonna meet with Ted Waite and the team there. And at certain times of the year, you literally, some of the areas weren't paved. So you kind of have to walk through some kind of muddy areas. We took our shoes and socks off, walked through the, the muddy areas and then entering into the office, they actually had a hose and you'd wash your feet off, put your shoes and socks back on and walk into the building. And you know, these guys knew hey, it's a pain in the ass, pardon my French, to come see us. But boy, it was a big deal if you did go see them. It was a, it was a sign of respect and it was a sign of honor to these companies. I, I don't know that it, I, what I'm describing of, of this new future, Bob, is quite at that level, but I, I wonder if business travel will, will, you know, if everybody travels for business constantly, by definition, it's lost it, its impact. Yeah. If yeah. everybody does something, it's a commodity, so what's the real value to it? And, and I guess that's where I'm going. I'm trying to figure out where's that puck going? What's it going towards? And it may just be what it is. It certainly has value as a commodity, but I'm wondering if something more meaningful, Bob, emerges from that. Yeah, yeah, I love that, the, the comparison too, with the, you know, the office is productivity tool, business travel as, you know, a, a differently deployed technology or a productivity tool, but that that unique uh, sense of special about it. I don't know how many times you and many people who are listening or watching uh, in years gone by would say, hey, look, we have to make a big show of force. You know, we got to bring everybody. They're going right. to have 12 people there. Right. We have to have 12 people there. And <laughs> uh at the time, in the context of that time, is it good? Yeah, it's got to be done. It's got to be done. But I think now that uh, we're going to find different ways to, you know, uh, rally around and show our support and show our enthusiasm. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I love the story there about the, uh, you know, the out of gateway uh, out. We are outstanding in our field. 
Some, somewhere I probably got a, you know, an old PC magazine with that ad or, or something that shows that, but it was, and they had a hell of a sense of humor on, on Friday afternoons, Bob, the whole company would stop manufacturing and no matter what your function was, they'd go into the warehouse and they would pack and ship uh -huh. uh, computers. <laughs> yeah. So no matter what you're, and every once in a while, if we were in town, we'd help out for an hour or so before our next meeting and, you know. A little, uh, you know, uh, late 20th century, early 21st century barn building. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tony. Hey, Bob, before we break, if I can make a couple of predictions that your your audience should, uh, should monitor closely. So for Q3, I made the comment about additive manufacturing is going to boom all automation. And I think adoption by manufacturing companies of technology certainly fits in there. A couple of others to keep your eye on. Um, shipping and logistics services, sort of an obvious point, but boy, we are still struggling to get uh, finished goods, particularly into the hands of consumers. And that is still a challenge for us. And, and if you think when Amazon pulls up to your door, if you just for a minute, whatever that product or service is, think of all the ingredients that went into that and the complexity of the shipping and logistics that, you know, that, that drive that you're going to see some real um, demand wow. changes there. You're also going to see some, some logistics things. So keep an eye on something called 3PL, third-party logistics. That's a booming category, and it combines technology, load fill, and a bunch of other things. Um, so those are, the, those are the ones I would encourage your, uh, your listeners to keep an eye on. And again, they can go to thomasnet.com and download the full report for free. Thomasnet.com. Excellent. And tell me what, that's the Q2 report, something that to be looked Q2 for. sourcing and supply chain activity report. All right. All right. Uh, drop your name. Will that help? Leave my, leave my name at the door. That may get you a little something. Don't know. You know, if they won't let you in. As you can tell, my uh, French bulldog, Vivian, really enjoys the Q2 sourcing report. So she's sounding off here a little bit. Would they say dogs are able to, to sense these things? You know, the they are. So I love the excitement. Uh, they are. Tony, this is wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, it's always great seeing you. The exciting stuff coming up. And I hope that, uh, you know, the rest of your summer, two thirds of it still left. Hope it's going great for you. Hey, Bob, thanks. It's always great to see you and look forward to seeing you next episode. All right, my friend. Thank you, Tony. Great to see you. And folks, thanks to all of you for being with us here at Cloud Wars Live. Hope your summer's going great as well. And we'll see you soon.